Hello friends and welcome back. I'm Mark Baker and today we're going to go into a new direction. We're going to start talking about responding to situations the way Jesus responded to them. The subject that the Holy Spirit has given me, I'm going to be calling walking as Jesus walked. And what we're going to look at over the next series of videos we're going to look at Jesus's ministry, but we're going to lay some foundation first. We're going to look at the life that God has called us to walk. One thing that concerns me as I interact with people and talk to people within the church is that it just seems like so many people are not experiencing the life that God has called them to experience. There's so much struggle with things that really should be simple, and I can understand totally because I've struggled with these things too in the past. Particularly when we're looking at faith, we make it out to be such a struggle, but God has called us to rest in the completed work of Christ. In Psalm chapter 23, which is a prophecy of the day we live in, it talks about the fact that we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that there will be enemies surrounding us. But in the midst of the darkness, we're told in Psalms 23 that God sets a table before us. So as I sat meditating on that and thinking about that, the Holy Spirit took me back to my childhood. When I was born, I didn't need to ask my parents, you know, to guarantee me they were going to take care of me. They just did. As I grew, you know, we had dinner time. I didn't have to fast before dinner time. I didn't have to go out in the kitchen and kneel before my mother and cry out to her that she'd provide me with dinner. I would just, at the time that we would have for dinner, I would go out to the table where I'd get in the car because a lot of times we went out to dinner, but there was just a confident expectation that the meal would be provided at the time we usually ate. Why did I have that confident expectation? Because I had faith in my parents' willingness to provide for me. And in looking at that as the Holy Spirit took me back to that, he started to show me that a lot of the issues we have with faith, with receiving from God, with our confidence in the provision, comes back to the fact that we do not have a confident expectation in his willingness to provide for us. One thing we're going to see and one thing we're going to talk about is relationship. There are a lot of Christians who know about God. There are a lot of Christians who know about the Holy Spirit. But do we know God? Do we know the Holy Spirit? There's a lot of people who know about the Word, who may have memorized verses in the, of the Bible, maybe even memorized scripts that they use when they go out to witness to people. But do they know the word? And when I say that, there's a vast difference between memorization and revelation. Revelation knowledge gained in times of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying it's not important for us to be memorizing scripture or to be looking and reading the Bible and things like that because the Holy Spirit will take the things we've read, we've memorized, and he will begin to speak to us. We talk about that still small voice. One thing we're going to see, you know, a commonly quoted verse when we start talking about faith is Romans 10, 17. Well, when you look at this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes, we need to hear with our physical ears and we need to see with our physical eyes. Peter calls the Word of God an incorruptible seed in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. We take that incorruptible seed, we plant it in our soul. 
And the Holy Spirit then takes what we have planted in our soul and he begins to speak to our spirit. When I talk about hearing from the Holy Spirit, when I talk about fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, you'll find that he'll speak to you in one of three ways. One is with an audible voice. And in all honesty, friend, he's never spoken to me in an audible voice. The second is an authoritative voice. It is such, there's such a force to it, such a reality when he speaks to you in that authoritative voice that it will seem like he's spoken to you audibly. But people around you can't hear it. The people I know who have heard the audible voice have had people around them also hear it. I'm reminded of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter and John were with Jesus, and they heard God speak from heaven, this is my beloved son. They heard the audible voice. The times where I have heard the authoritative voice of the Holy Spirit were when he was trying to warn me of danger or situation coming up. But your daily fellowship, what we will hear the most is that still small voice where he is speaking to us and we're hearing him with the ear of our spirit. Why do I bring that up at this point? Well, in Romans 10, 17, when it says faith comes by hearing, there's a couple things there that are important for what we're going to be looking at as we move forward. First of all, the word faith. We're going to look at this a little bit deeper, and we have our new book coming up, Walking in the Faith of the Son of God. And some of the things we're going to look at in this series will come from that book. But the word faith, is translated from the Greek word pistis, which is a faith that can only be received as a gift from God. We can't generate it through our own human effort. When it talks about hearing, it's talking about hearing with the inner ear. How do we hear with the inner ear, friend? In fellowship with the Holy Spirit, because He is a spirit, we are a spirit, we have a soul, which is our mind, will, intellect, and emotions, and we live in a body. When he speaks to us in that still small voice, he is speaking to us and we're hearing him with our inner ear, which is the ear of our spirit. He is a spirit speaking to us who are spirit. So many people struggle with this because they're trying to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit with their soul or their physical ears. Nine times out of ten, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, he's speaking to us and we are hearing him with the ear of our spirit. We'll talk about that more as we move along in the series. But for now, let's start in 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to look, look at a text that will come from 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And then we're going to move forward and see all that the Holy Spirit has for us. But as we get started, let's go ahead and ask him for his help. Holy Spirit, I thank you for each person that you've drawn to these programs. Jesus said in John chapter 16, we read that he told his disciples just before he went to the cross, just before his arrest, that he would send you as their other comfort. Well, that would be profitable for us to have you in our lives. He told us that you would reveal Jesus to us. So Holy Spirit, for each person watching this program, watching this broadcast, I just ask you to teach them, to guide them. You're our teacher, our guide, and I yield my lips to you, to your anointing. I thank you for the teaching gift. And Father God, I look to you. You loved us so much that you sent Jesus. And I ask you to open the eyes of every person who watched this program understanding, open their spiritual eyes, give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation, let them know the hope of their calling, the riches of their inheritance, the Holy Spirit that is within them, and the working of your mighty power in their life. I surround each one with faith and love and declare your blessings over them. And thank you, Father, for your goodness in Jesus' name. So friend, here in First John chapter 2 and verse 6, it said, He that says he abides in him, talking about Jesus, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. 
he that says he abides in him. The word abide here is talking about a dwelling place. The person who makes their dwelling place in Christ Jesus should walk as Jesus walked. What does Paul, what does John mean by this, friend? Well, when we talk about walk, if you go back to the original language and look at this, it's talking about the way we conduct our life. In other words, our behaviors, our actions, the way we respond to situations, the way we respond to external situations. When he's talking about walking as Jesus walked, he's referencing all of these things. So what John is telling us is a person who makes their home, their dwelling place in Christ Jesus should respond to the situations of life, to re respond to the simulation simulations, respond to the pressures of life just as Jesus would. Sounds like a tall order, doesn't it, friend? But it's not. I don't believe John would have said that if it weren't possible. But that sounds a lot different than what we're seeing in a lot of people's lives today. Do we respond to symptoms in our body as Jesus would have responded? Do we respond to trials and tests and situations as Jesus responded? These are questions we're going to look at. And starting out, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because if we want to know how Jesus walked, how he responded, what was his core value? Because when we're talking about the conduct of life, we're talking about the core values of a person the very core of that person. I have heard arguments over the years that Jesus ministered as the Son of God. But in Philippians, Paul tells us he set aside his divinity and became a man. I've heard different ones argue. I've read of different theologians. I've read different commentaries with, they argue that you know, it doesn't say specifically that Jesus walked in by faith. And I want to give you a couple things as we get started, because this is important to understanding how Jesus responded to situations. If we are going to walk as Jesus walked, then we're going to have to learn what his foundation was. When we look in the Gospels, we see the miraculous we see the miracles that manifested. In John chapter 14, we see where Jesus told his disciples that the works that he did, we could do also. He also told them that we should be doing greater works. There's a lot of arguments that have gone on throughout church history about what those greater works are. But for our purposes in this study, I want to move backwards to the works. Because when you look in the Gospels, we see Jesus raising the dead. We see him cleansing the lepers, healing blind eyes, opening up deaf ears. We see paralytics instantly running and leaping and dancing. We see that also in the book of Acts. When was the last time you saw something like that manifest in your church, friend? I hear testimonies of healing. I've been to meetings where I've seen healings. I've seen the miraculous. But when I look back to my 30 plus years of being in the church, I think it would be pressing it to say that they were more than the exception, than the rule. There's a part of me that doesn't want to say that because I would rather say the miraculous was the rule rather than the exception. Because when you look at Jesus' life and ministry, the miraculous was the rule. Friend, I am convinced 
that God has ordained for you and I to walk in the miraculous. Going back to the illustration of my growing up years, I would go to dinner and sit down with no doubt in my mind that there would be food made available. I didn't have to worry about how that food was transported to the house. I didn't have to worry about where the money came from to pay the grocery bill. I didn't have to worry about how that money was earned because I had a confident expectation as a child of my parents' willingness to provide for us. And I recognize, friend, that the enemy has come against the family unit, and some of you may not be able to relate to that. But that is a primary picture of how faith should work. We shouldn't have to be sitting around trying to figure out faith, trying to put, you know, trying to put it all together. What are our steps? What are and that's why you hear me so many times if you've been watching these broadcasts talk about it all coming back to relationship. Because I have a relationship with my Heavenly Father. I have confidence in His willingness to do what He said He would do in His Word for me. When I read things like Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that tell me that He has already provided everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, I shouldn't have to wonder how that provision is going to come. You know, the Holy Spirit asked me an interesting question when I was thinking about growing up as a child at the dinner table. He asked me, did I ever once wonder if the food was going to come? Did I ever once wonder when they took us out to dinner? You know, my dad's favorite restaurant was Jerry's. Did I ever once sit there concerned, worrying, or fretting over how the bill would be paid when the waiter or waitress brought it to our table. I didn't, because I had a confident expectation in my natural father and my natural mother's ability to pay. I had a confident expectation of their provision. If I could have that kind of confident expectation in my natural father and my natural mother, Shouldn't I have an even higher level of confidence in my Heavenly Father's ability to provide and in His willingness to provide? And that's where it comes down to, walking as Jesus walked. Living, breathing relationship. That's what Christianity is all about, friend. John 17, verse 3. Once again, if you've watched these programs, you've heard me say it because it's a commonly quoted verse in, these, in this broadcast. This is eternal life that you might know, that you might have an intimate relationship with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. The reason God saved us was for relationship. The reason He heals us is for relationship. The reason He provides for us is because of relationship. I often wonder, friend, if you and I can even begin to grasp how much our Heavenly Father loves us. But let's look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've already seen that John tells us that if we're going to abide to live in Christ, then we should walk as He walked. We should conduct our lives as he conducted his life. In the Gospels, when we look at those accounts of healing in the miraculous, how did Jesus conduct his life? What was his behaviors? What was his stimulus, his response to situations, to the pressures of life? He responded with the Word of God. He responded with the miraculous. When confronted by leprosy, he didn't start wringing his hands, looking at the leper, saying, Oh, I just hope God will come through. No, he said, Be clean, be whole. According to your faith, be it unto you. He responded with a confident expectation, birth in a relationship with his Heavenly Father. 
in John chapter 8, we see where Jesus said that he only did those things the Father said. How would he know what the Father said? And how would he have recognized the Father's voice if he was not spending time with the Father, if he did not have a relationship with the Father? I pass by a, you know, when I go out and drive, we go to drive to church. We might pass, you know, a hundred or more cars on the roads as we're driving to church. I pass by those people, which means I had an interaction with them because they drove a vehicle beside me or on going the other way, but I didn't know them. I wouldn't have a confident expectation in anything that they might say or do because I don't know what they're saying or what they're doing in their cars, but we're interacting. We're around each other. You know, we might sit next to each other at a light, but there's no interaction. There's no relationship, so there's no confidence. There are a lot of people who know about God. There's a lot of people who know about the Holy Spirit. But how often do we just turn things off and sit down and say, Holy Spirit, what would you like to talk about today? Everything comes back to relationship. So here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Something that was very interesting to me as I'm going through this with the Holy Spirit is once again we see the same Greek word that was used in 1 John chapter 2. We walk by faith. We conduct our lives by faith. We respond to the situations of life by faith. Our behaviors are governed by faith. The word faith, once again, in this verse is pistis, a faith that could only be received as a gift from God. And we're going to look more deeply at this. But again, our behaviors are governed by a faith that can only be received by God, not a faith that you and I can stir up or build ourselves, not a faith that we can grow. Our behaviors are governed by faith. Our lives are conducted by the faith that's received from God. Our actions, our responses to, you know, a doctor's diagnosis, to a bill that comes in, to our bank accounts, should be governed by the faith that comes from God. My actions as a child, going back to that illustration, it's a simple illustration, were governed by my faith in my parents. I walked to that table with a confidence of being fed because I had faith developed in relationship with my parents. I recognize not everybody can say that, but for our illustration, and it's sad because I believe that's one reason why the enemy has come against the family unit. Because the family unit should be a picture of God's provision. We should learn about our Heavenly Father by looking to our natural parents. But in this day and age we've, we live in, the enemy has destroyed the family unit. And far too many people base their view of God on what they've seen from their parents. But this illustration still applies. The way we should be operating, the way children should be operating, is they should be seeing that their parents are providing for them and they should be developing a confident expectation. In the same way, we can have a confident expectation in God. We sit across the table from a doctor and the doctor gives us a diagnosis and I've been there. Our response to the doctor's report should not be from our natural human faith, our natural knowledge. It should be from a confident expectation in the fact that we have a loving Heavenly Father who has already provided us healing. So think about that as we come down to the final few minutes of the program. If you had confidence in God as your healer, would you respond differently to symptoms that came up in your body? 
if you had confidence in the fact that God has already healed you, would you respond differently when facing a symptom or a diagnosis? I believe you would, friend, and I know that as I'm learning this and I'm growing in this, I'm seeing my responses are changing. Why is that? Because I know that my Heavenly Father has already provided healing before that diagnosis came. So from that standpoint, I'm not receiving the diagnosis as a person sick, you know, with a certain disease, with might be cancer, might be diabetes, it might be arthritis, whatever that doctor is pronouncing over you. Those symptoms may be occurring in my physical body, but I do not have that diagnosis because I have a confident expectation birthed in relationship that my father provided healing through the broken body of Jesus before those symptoms even began to manifest. So I am a healed person pushing those symptoms, pushing those diseases, pushing those situations out of my physical being. I am conducting my life by the faith of the Son of God. Can you see where that's different, friend? We are not the sick trying to get healed. We are the healed pushing sickness out of our physical being. Well, we're at the end of our time, and as we close out, I just want to remind you, Carolyn, I love you. We pray for you, and please send us an email, prayer at MB Media Ministries, and let us know how we can stand and pray with you. Send us your praise reports, too. We want to shout and rejoice with you with all God's doing in your life.